I'm pretty excited to be here tonight. First of all, I've got a few friends who were kind enough to join me here. And for a very long time, they actually thought, <laughs> thanks guys, for a very long time, they actually thought I worked in wind energy for well over a year. So if nothing else, tonight's going to clarify the fact that I actually work in solar energy. <laughs> so how did I first get into it? Well, after my second year of university, I was really feeling a little lost there. I didn't know why I was there or, or what I wanted to do afterwards. So I decided to take a year off and do some traveling. And during that year, I really asked myself, what do I want to do when I graduate? And I thought it might be really fun to try and make money and help the environment at the same time. So when I got back to school, I said, okay, my summer job next year, I'm going to look for a job at a renewable energy company. So I started looking up all these companies and making calls, and finally I got an interview at a company in Toronto. So I went in for the interview, and about two days later they sent me an email saying, I'm sorry we can't hire you at this time. Just about gave up. I said, you know what, I'll give one last kick at the can. I emailed back and I said, you know what, you're making a mistake. I'm going to work hard for you. I really want to get into it, and here are three reasons why you should hire me. And they sent me an email back and said, okay, you start on Monday. <laughs> so I worked for them for that summer, and I continued working for them after I graduated for about eight months. And while I was there, I sort of learned the basics of what a renewable energy developer does. They, they build renewable energy projects, wind projects or solar projects. And I learned the five basic steps to get one from inception to in the ground. So I'll just quickly run through them for you. The first step is you'd want to go out and you'd want to find a good location for your project. So for a solar project, I'm talking about large scale projects here, so I'll get to some pictures in a minute which might help you visualize it. But we're talking about a farmer's field, about 50 to 100 acres, and you're looking for a number of variables that make it a good site, and I won't get into that. So that's your first step, find a good project location. Step two, apply for a contract to be able to sell that electricity back to the electrical grid so everyone here, for example, could use it. Step three, if you get that contract, go forward and get all your permits that you need, get your engineers to design exactly how it's gonna look. Step four, get your construction financing, so the money to build it, and step five would just be to build it. So I learned these basic ropes. And about two years ago, this was right in the height of the financial crisis, I got let go with a bunch of other employees. And right around that time, Ontario was starting to take a serious look and say, you know what, I think we should make a move on this renewable energy sector here. So they created the Green Energy Act. Or, well, they hadn't created it yet, actually, when I got let go. I knew it was coming up soon. And I said, you know what, if I'm ever going to give a kick at the can and try and start up my own company, it might as well be now. So that's what I did. So what I decided to do was focus on the first step of those five. Look for good project locations, secure land rights. And that's what I did. And I was able to sell five project locations to a larger power company that has now ended up getting contracts for those five, is going through the permitting and design right now, and hopefully construction will start on them later this year. And since then, this year, I was able to find a private equity firm to back some more projects that we're trying to go through now and hopefully take it all the way to construction. So I'm pretty excited about that. So I want to talk to you today about solar energy and how it's going to make sense in Ontario for two reasons. One is that eventually it will be cost competitive in Ontario, but first it's actually going to be cost competitive in more sunny countries. That makes sense, right? You get more output, so your cost is lower per unit of energy. So I'm going to talk about how in Ontario what we need to do here is create a manufacturing industry that we can export our technology to these sunny countries when it becomes cost competitive in those countries. And we all talk about solar energy being so expensive, it might surprise some of you that in five to ten years it will actually be cost competitive in sunny countries. So I want to start by looking at where we get our electricity from today. Oh, I thought we were on the slide. Let's go to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, so this is where we get it from today, uh, and, and obviously electricity, we get a lot of, we emit a lot of our greenhouse gases through electricity, so this is an important thing to look at. And as you can see, most of it today is generated through fossil fuels, coal being the biggie. And hydroelectric, nuclear, wind, and solar, they do a smaller part. Solar, if you can see it there, is just the yellow sliver right now in the middle. So hopefully we can grow that piece. And as we've heard already tonight, as developing nations continue to advance, 
our global energy demands are going to keep on increasing. And at the same time, the scientists are telling us that our carbon emissions need to come way down. So what that means is these cleaner four sources on the left-hand side need to grow to hopefully one day make up the entire pie. Now I'm just going to talk a little bit about uh, each of those four sources, and I think they're all important part of the solution. So hydroelectricity, it's a great resource. Unfortunately, not every country in the world has the fresh lakes and rivers necessary for this type of power. Uh, nuclear power, this station is actually just about a 10 or 15 minute drive away from here. And some of its challenges uh, can be obvious. Uh, it takes a lot of technical expertise, obviously, to build a nuclear plant. So when we're talking about developing countries, maybe not there yet. It can take about 10 years to actually build one of these plants. And as well, there's obviously the problem of how we deal with all the radioactive waste. Wind power is good. Uh, and uh, the problem with wind and solar as well is that it does face some reliability issues. The wind doesn't blow all the time and the sun doesn't shine all the time. But that, so we, we can't rely on wind and solar for all of our power, but we can get a good portion of it fr from those sources. And particularly in countries where hydroelectric power can act as a backup to come online when the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining, we can have more. And also in countries that are larger. So if you think about Ontario even, the sun's not going to stop shining across Ontario all at once. Um, and as well, uh, once electric vehicles become more mainstream, particularly plug-in electric vehicles, uh, and I, I saw on our on our uh, agenda here, and we're looking at a, a TED talk later tonight from TED.com that Shia Gossi gives, which is my favorite actually, so I'm excited, excited to listen to it again. Uh, and he talks about electric vehicles and how they can act as a battery storage system to actually allow more renewables online as well. So when many of you think of solar, you probably think of uh, you know, solar panels on a roof like this one. But increasingly around the world, these projects are becoming larger and larger to get better economies of scale. Because what we really need here is solar to compete on a cost basis if it's ever gonna make up an appreciable portion of our generation. So here we have a larger scale solar project. And this is actually row upon row of solar panels. So I've just lay on a green rectangle here. That's actually the size of a football field. So we're talking about pretty large scale projects. Um, so, we want, to, we want to try and get, um, obviously the ideal would be to get rid of fossil fuels. Some people will say, you know, we can try and capture uh, the carbon that, that coal plants emit and pump it underground. I'm not sure if that's such a good idea. It might eventually come out. Um, so nuclear might have to make a good portion of it. Um, but what I really want to focus on today is the solar. So I hope within the next 25 years, we can get 25, sorry, in the next 25 years, we can get 10% of our electricity from solar, which I think is a realistic goal. Um, now, the cost of solar is coming down. And as I mentioned, it, it will be competitive in these sunny countries. And uh, what the main, one of the main questions I want to ask today is, once these floodgates are open, once it com becomes competitive on a cost basis, so it's the obvious choice for a sunny country saying, hey, we need more electricity. The floodgates are open. Who's going to manufacture all those solar panels? So what I'm here to say tonight is that I think it's very important for a place like Ontario to really look and say, hey, we could be a manufacturing hub for solar panels. It's a great business opportunity here in addition to the fact that it's important we do this for the climate. So here's a map of <clears throat> how sunny it is in the world. Uh, you can see sort of close to the equator, there's the sun belt across the middle. So if you were to hold up a solar panel near, near the equator, you get a, almost double the electricity that you would if you had it, you see the black star there is about where we are, than if you held up where we are. So what that means, as I mentioned before, is that that electricity near the equator, you could sell for about half the price, because you're getting double the electricity. And what's interesting to note is that a lot of the developing countries that are having very high growth in energy demand are also a lot of these sunniest countries. But if you're a developing nation, you're saying, okay, you know, we need more energy. They didn't create climate change. They're, they're not going to choose solar while it's still more expensive. Wouldn't be, you know, if you were in their shoes, you wouldn't do it either. 
And I think it's really important that we continue the diplomatic efforts to try and reduce greenhouse gases. But the fact is, over the last 10 and 20 years, even while we're all talking about it, it's still going up and up. And another way we can try and tackle that is to invest in the technologies that will actually make helping the environment the cheaper way to go forward. And I think that's a very important point. So let's take a look at the cost of solar and how it's changed over the last 20 years. So along the bottom here you see we're looking at from 1990 up to 2010, so that's the blue line here. And then in a minute we're going to project that into the next five and ten years. So you can see it's come down quite steadily. And I should say this is, this is the price assuming that we're in a sunny country. So assuming we're, we're in a place that gets a lot of output. Uh, you can see there was a bit of a bump there right around 2005. There was a global shortage of silicon, which is the main component of solar panels. That's since been figured out. Prices keep on going down. Um, so let's take a look. Okay, so in a sunny country, 2010 today, uh, the cost of solar electricity is about 20 cents a kilowatt hour, just a little over it. And a kilowatt hour, you may be familiar with that. That's the unit, the cost you would see on your electricity bill when you go home if you look it up. Say, okay, how much does this cost per kilowatt hour? So let's project that out five years. And also, let's look now at the cost of what the other sources are. So if we were going to build a new nuclear power plant, how much would that cost? So you see that the more sort of expensive end of what we can expect electricity to cost, let's say you're in a country that doesn't have access to cheap coal, or let's say your nuclear power plant has some cost overruns, which often happens, you might expect electricity to cost about 15 cents a kilowatt hour. So you see, if we just project this graph down on the trend that it's already going, and with all the research and development happening, it will continue to go that way, I think. Already in five years in a sunny country, we're starting to be competitive with the more expensive alternatives. And if we project that another five years, now if you're in a country that has a more abundant coal or your nuclear plant comes in on budget, we'll be at about 10 cents. And in 10 years, you're now competing with that lower end. So that's quite amazing to think of eventually, well, quite soon, we're going to be competing on a cost basis. So as I say, who's going to manufacture all those solar panels? I think it's important that Ontario could come in here and have a real opportunity. So I want to take a second to explain as well that um, electricity, the cost of electricity today in Ontario would be about seven cents a kilowatt hour. So that would be just below this 10 cent line here. And I was going to add another line in and then I was thinking this is getting way too cluttered so I'll just mention it. Um, so, and the reason for that is that, I'll give you an example. If you buy a house and you have a mortgage on that house, your cost of living there at first is quite high as you pay down your mortgage every month. But after 30 years, you've paid off your mortgage and your cost becomes much lower. So the same is true of the power industry in Ontario. So most of our generation was built in the 60s and 70s, so now it's been paid off so they can sell it for a bit cheaper. So when we talk about the cost of wind or the cost of solar, it's very important that we're comparing it to the cost of building a new nuclear plant, not what a nuclear plant from 30 years ago can sell its electricity for because its mortgage has already been paid off. Um, so now let's look at the cost of solar in Ontario. So you see it's the same shape here, but because there's less sun, it would be more expensive. So today in 2010, you can see that it would be about 44 cents a kilowatt hour to produce solar electricity in Ontario. And coincidentally, that's what the Green Energy Act pays. Make sense? So quite a bit more expensive than our other alternatives. So does this make sense? If we project it out five and 10 years, we get to 20 cents a kilowatt hour, so still more expensive. So is that a smart idea? And what I'd say is that in order for it to be a smart idea, Ontario has to use these projects that we're building now to learn, gain expertise, bring a manufacturing hub to Ontario. I think we need to be investing a lot more in research and development in Ontario's universities in solar energy and really create a lot of experts so that in five or 10 years, when solar becomes cost competitive in these sunny countries, we can sell our technology that we have the lead in, that we're experts in, to all these countries and make money off it at the same time. So this will be, uh, so sorry, last year, th this is a graph showing the uh, green energy jobs in Ontario. And last year there was just over 10,000 people working in this industry in Ontario. 
And with the Green Energy Act, that's expected to go, grow quite quickly. Um, this year, we'll add about 20,000 jobs, up to 30,000. Next year, another 20,000. But a lot of that is well, this initial you know, subsidies are in place for this more expensive electricity. And what I think is really important is that we focus on bringing manufacturing to Ontario. As I say, doing a lot more research and development at Ontario's universities to become experts so that we can continue that over the next few years so that we can start selling our solar panels into other parts of the world where it becomes cost competitive and they're gonna want it, not, because, not only because it's the right environmental thing to do, but because it makes financial sense. So that's, uh, that's pretty much the end of my talk. I think uh, that, you know, there's a lot of environmental reasons to do this here, and there's some business cases to be made as well. So I just wanted to uh, bring that to the table today. Thanks very much for listening.